everyone, and welcome to the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee webinar on Principles of Classification. I'm Janet Arberg, your host. Now, before we begin, I want to point out that the hashtag on the bottom of the screen is for all of you who want to follow us on Twitter. Okay, let's start. Uh, our presenter today is Lai Ma. Lai is a PhD candidate and adjunct lecturer at the School of Library and Information Science from Indiana University at Bloomington, where she also attained, uh, excuse me, obtained a MLS. Lai has taught courses in the area of knowledge organization for more than four years. Her research interests include the interrelationship between information infrastructure and society. Welcome, Lai. Um, during the program, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the question box on your screen. Lai will answer those questions at the end of her presentation. If all the pres uh, questions are not answered when the hour has ended, then the session may run a few minutes over time. For those of you that need to sign off, please note that you can hear the answers to the question as the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the program with a link to the recording and to the slides. And if necessary, Lai will provide answers to the question that end up not being completed during the program. Okay, we're getting ready to start and as we turn the presentation over to Lai, there may be a slight delay. Okay, um, I hope that this is working. It seems like I have. <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead with the slideshow, and um, and uh, if anything that is not working, I believe that the, the technical staff will let me know. Um, um, thank you, Jeanette, for uh, the introduction, and uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present a webinar uh, in this context, and, and I have been having quite a lot of fun teaching classification in classes, but uh, in a very short webinar form, I'm not sure I will answer all the questions or what you are expecting. However, if you have any questions that are much more specific than what I'm presenting here. Please do ask your questions. Um, for some of the questions, I might need a little bit more time to answer, but uh, I will get back to you uh, regardless. So in this presentation, I'm really trying to get into the so-called principles of classification, and I'll begin with a little bit of introduction of how we think about classification and then we will get into thinking, um, looking at some characteristics of two most commonly used classification system in the United States. Um, indeed, um, Library of Congress classification and Dewey Decimal classification and indeed both the systems have been used not only in the United States but internationally and we will take a very, very quick look, very, very brief look on these two different systems and then we will ask the question, how do we choose a classification if we do have a choice and or actually within even one of the systems, um, sometimes we do have to think about questions like the breadth and depth of classes that we're choosing. So we will start off with some very simple and um, hopefully fun exercises in the very beginning and to talk about classification. So um, to classify as human, um, if you look around your room that where you are sitting in or look at your desk or look at your desktop, uh, we all know that we, we we do classify things in our day-to-day -day life and it is almost like a very basic cognitive um, 
ability that we have. So I, I have put three groups of things here. It is as if like um, um, cognitive exercise for elementary school student. And then I will ask you, so which one of the things uh, un, do not belong to this group? All right. So for the first group, we have apple, broccoli, orange, pear, grape, and so on and so forth. And then group two, we have a little bit tricky thing there. Dublin, London, Paris, Indianapolis, Rome, Berlin. And then group, group three, um, we have you know um, a lot of different species of animals. So if I ask you to choose to say that, well, choose one in each group that does not belong to this group, I think most of you will be able to do that. And most of you would likely choose the same thing. But we have to think about it. How does that happen? Um, uh, why do we have the same categorization, if not classification, um, of these things? And, and how do we learn about this? Now, it really depends on this is how we conceptualize certain things. And in uh, some literature, some people are talking about with different cultural context, or if you're speaking in a very different language, all these things might not make sense to you, or might not, um, you might not categorize them uh, as most other pe people do. So there's something very interesting here, particularly if we look at the group three. Um, I think there could be multiple categorization that we might want to put in the different groups of this in in this particular category. Um, one interesting story, um, and I have a colleague who recently moved to Dublin, Ireland, and um, so she was claiming the relocation for reimbursement and most of the cost was covered. However, however, the moving of her cat over to Ireland, they do not cover that particular expenses. The reason is that they do not consider cat as a pet in Ireland, but they see cats as um, farm animals. So there we could see that this definitely different categorization that leads to a different uh, treatment or whether you are going to reimburse. So going back to our desktop, you have a lot of folders or uh, I'm a, actually a rather messy person as I was always say that, well, I teach organization. But I'm not a very organized person, but a lot of you will have different categories, you know, that you put things in folders. And this is almost like this is your own classification system. This is your own categorization system that might not be shared by others. But when we say we want to have a classification system that's shared by others and used by other people, I think one thing that we really want is that that classification system will be agreed by most people. So, well, what are the principles of classification as we know then? Well, there are actually many, many and multiple different principles of classification, it depends on what you are talking about. So in Linnaeus classification, plants and animals, they are classified by their reproductive system, their sex, their sex organs really. And, and in other forms of um, classification, for example, the classification of cancers, um, they are organized by, by organs, but it, it has actually raised a lot of questions in terms of whether, whether classif classification of cancer by organs would be a, is a good way of classifying the disease because it's not necessarily by organ, but by a certain um, genetic um, functions. So a lot of these things are just all around us and then if we talk about social classifications, we, the world is organized by many, many different things. Uh, sometimes we we'll talk about using race as a class, a classification, 
class, and then um, sometimes we will use some other criteria in terms of to differentiate uh, different things. And as we think about that, classification systems is really talking about sameness and difference. What uh, what things are similar or the same that we put them into a group and what things that we consider they are not the same and we are going to put that into a different group. In the knowledge universe, well, uh, by which I mean that the knowledge universe in the library that we usually deal with is that, well, we have a lot of different types of books, e-books, um, media, res audio resources or video resources, etc., etc. We have all these things around us. How are we going to classify that? Um, in any one of the classification systems for categorization of library, um, in recent 100 years, 100 years ago, it could be a little bit different because there was not the concept or not as uh, heavy as the concept of subject control. But since the day of Dewey or since the day around 1800, subject control becomes the most common way of um, organizing the bibliographic universe. So. In this sense, most uh, most classification systems and um, most classification systems for organizing knowledge, they are classified by subject. So, as we all know, in some ways, <laughs> we we will talk about Library of Congress classification in very very soon or Dewey Decimal classification. All these classification systems, they are basically organized in terms of subject knowledge. However, although each of the classification system might have a different um, way of how they think about subject knowledge. So these are the things that we want to bear in mind. Each uh, classification system may be devised by very, very different principles, although uh, they are all dif um, working with um, oh, my slides are not moving, so just give me a moment. Oops. All right. So uh, here I want to um, take a look at the at the um, Library of Congress classification first, and then we will move on to um, deal with decimal classification. So, what is the Library of Congress classification? And uh, we know that this is one of the most commonly used classification systems in the United States, particularly in academic library. So, just a little bit of history about this classification. Um, First of all, the Library of Congress was founded by Order of Congress in January 1802. It's really, it hasn't been that long at all um, with the act, an act concerning the library for the use of both houses of Congress. And then, um, since then, subject approach was applied in 1812 uh, with an adaptation of the classification schedule developed by the Library Company of Philadelphia. The Library of Congress, however, then was burned in 1814, and then they purchased Thomas Jefferson's collection. Um, when this collection got, got into the Library of Congress, uh, they have been using Charles Carter's expensive classification, and then they modify it for organizing the collection. And a new sis classification system, especially for the Library of Congress, was developed in around 1901. So the story here is like, before then, the collection was not necessarily um, organized by the by a certain subject 
subject control, but sometimes it could be alphabetical list, and then in the old days, as we remember, we have all these shelf lists that actually, you know, indicating where the book belongs on a, a certain shelf, and and every time when the book was relo is relocated, then they will ha have to actually put in on the shelf list a, a new location of that book. Um, with classification system, as we all know, then shelving is not as um, difficult or is not as clumsy that every time some an, a new book is collected, then a, a, a shelf list has to be updated. It just gets onto the um, shelf. So, what are the general principles of Library of Congress classification in the very beginning? Then, so um, interestingly, you can look at this um, principles written by Herbert Putnam, which was the librarian of the Library of Congress in 1916, and he says um, the scheme adopted has been devised with reference to the character and probable development of our own collections, to its operation by our own staff, and to the characteristics and habits of our own readers, and to the usage in book here. So, one thing about Library of Congress classification is that it was really devised based on, based on the collection that um, the Library of Congress used to collect, okay, and and then it is very it was very clearly stated that there was no exception that the scheme would be adopted by other libraries, much less was there any profession that it would be suited their needs. Um, one thing very very interesting here is how it has become such a popular choice for all libraries, or um, in particular, academic libraries. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we have developed a, a, a concept that's called literary warren as a principle, one of the principle. Uh, if you look at uh, the Library of Congress classification, there were 22 um, classes, main classes there, and um, and uh, how are these classes? Um, how do they decide which class we are going to devise and order? And one concept that's behind the the, the decision is a literary warrant. Um, which means that classes are created to cope with the literature that must be classified by the scheme rather than on the basis of any theoretical analysis of knowledge. Um, here, what it means is that Library of Congress classification system is somehow collection-based. It is not based on how you think about the knowledge universe and how um, is the new knowledge universe should be organized. It's really looking at the collection and then you look at that and see how we go, are going to organize the, the collection. So in that case, because it is based on initially Thomas Jefferson's collection, it has a rather strong U.S. bias because, well, it is obvious that the, the, the development is when it's based on a certain collection and you would consider Thomas Jefferson will have a big collection of books that's concerned with the U.S. issues rather than European or Asian issues. So it has a rather strong U.S. bias and, and it has become that um, another thing would be it is very detailed in subjects such as law, politics, and administration, um, military, and naval science. So, in the in the scheme, what you could see is that 
or mil military science actually occupies one of the class of the 22 main classes and naval science as well. And this, as I know, have never been the case for any other classification schemes for organizing uh, materials in the library. And, and, um, and you could also see that if you know that um, Library of Congress classification, the notation is usually a combination of one to two letters and then with a number, so-called alphanumeral notation. Uh, in some of these classes, such as law and politics, sometimes, once in a while, because it's so detailed that um, you could would be able to see some of the classes with actually three letters with a very long number. Um, on the other hand, it is, uh, it was, uh, at least it was much less detailed in science and technology. So you can see each of the classes uh, might have a more of um, the density of each class could be very different. Uh, w within the science technology class, it, the, the T, for example, you might have you might not have a lot of choices to choose from, uh, whereas in the law section, you, it might be very, very detailed, and it goes on for 30 pages. And um, so the strength of the classification system is really in those, those uh, particular classes. And um, in terms of science and technology, um, it is not a very strong classification, and I understand that a lot of special libraries, they would use a very different or actually sometimes more specialized classification, um, such as the universal decimal classification for those subject areas because um, of the development in those subjects are much better in that case. However, um, just to note to that, universal decimal classification um, is not a very, very common classification that's used in the U.S. And, and last, last time I checked, um, the only institution actually in the United States who's using universal decimal classification is um, Microsoft. So that's just um, a little bit of a sidetrack there. Okay, so Library of Congress classification is an enumerative classification system. Enumerative in the sense that it lists all possible classes. So um, if you look into this, there's not a chance for you to say, I'm going to construct a new class on the fly, all right? Um, in, in that case, it you get a sense of a, um, you have to look for something and you cannot create something within the classification system. So if you have a resource uh, right in front of you and you are going to say, I am going to choose a classification, a class for this particular resource, you are really going to choose one of the boxes um, that's already available. Okay, so um, all the compound subjects are pre-coordinated and listed, and, and um, there are this extensive repetition of concepts across all the systems. So you will see each subject, they will list all technology, encyclopedias, periodicals, etc. And then if you go to another class, politics, and then pol pol political science, and they will again have all these um, encyclopedias, periodicals and list listed there because of the enumerative system. And another thing that we would want to you know, sort of look at is that LCC is a broad and shallow classification. So if we are looking at the hierarchy here, or some, oops, <laughs> don't mean that. Um, the hierarchy around here, so we have 22 main classes over the top, but they usually, it really doesn't go very deep uh, most of the time. So if you want to create a very detailed structure, class number, uh, using LC, if it is not all, already available, then you are not going to be able to do that. So um, 
in this sense, it has the advantage that with a particular bigger collection, um, of, and, and that's one of the reasons why academic libraries really uh, usually use this particular system is that it, it provides a very a sort of clean and clear um, way to organize all the materials needed because a lot of times when you have a lot of materials uh, with a very um, a, a wide scope of subjects, then then Library of Congress classification really works that way. Um, if you are using DDC Dewey, however, a lot of times the because Dewey can get very very details, but it might not be necessary for a general um, academic library. But we will talk about Dewey in in just a few moments, um, and then we can compare and contrast the two. <coughs> Okay, let's see. Oops. All right. So um, here, uh, I basically have talked about this LCC notation and how it works. And um, when you look at that, it's really, one thing we need to think about classification is that it's really for collocation, but really not only not only on the shelf. Now, traditionally, I understand that most um, most of us will say, well, classification systems are uh, actually because it is part of the call number um, is really for shelving purpose as and uh, as we move beyond just physical materials and we have so many online materials, will, I, will classification still be important in the future? So there, there are a lot of things I think it was misunderstood because if one goes on to WorldCat and and then if you like a certain book, usually these days the, both the LC numbers and the Dewey numbers, um, you can click into it and then it will lead you to the resource that belongs to that particular classification. So I was just playing around with it this morning and then uh, if you're interested in, for example, um, photography of birds and, and if you, you want a handbook and manuals, um, I, I find one of the books on those there and then however if I click on the subject headings it retrieves two results for me. Uh, however if I goes into the classification and then I click on the, the, the particular class it actually uh, retrieves more than a hundred um, items for me. So it, what I um, uh, say here is that the assigning a class for a resource not only is not only for shelving purpose, uh, but uh, really um, in the OPAC, one could design it for a retrieval purpose that works wonderfully. Now, but of course, I do uh, do not deny the function of classification in terms of putting things on a shelf because it really, really helps. It really, really helps with um, <clears throat> with it. It really helps with um, organizing items and 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 collocating these different items different things on the bookshelf and I myself have very very good experience in terms of excuse me in in terms of um, f discovery of resource because of the nicely done um, class uh, shel shelving so but but for those of you who are not very familiar with this uh, we will know also that However, when I show you the numbers that you're shelving, um, part of it is the call number, but another part of it will be so-called the book number, which is devised from a very different source, and usually we will find some of this cutter's table that we will um, create these numbers. So, um, but in any case, it's a combination of things that form the call number, but classification itself, uh, I would say, is still very, very important and we would 
have to consider how to <clears throat> how to um, create a class number, or it's not creating, but selecting a class number most of the time. Um, but in the sense that if you really want to create a class number, of course, there are forms to fill out and there are communities to go through. So um, now we are going to move on to Dewey. Um, <clears throat> Dewey Decimal Classification is actually older than the LCC, all right? It was first published anonymously in 1876 under the title A Classification and Subject Index for Cataloging and Arranging the Books and Pamphlets of the Library. Um, and most of us know that it was um, developed by Melville Dewey when he was a library assistant at Amherst College. And um, when we talk about Melville Dewey, I mean, a lot of fun things about him. We should talk about the fact that he was, he is the first, he founded the most, um, the first U.S. library school that's called the Columbia School of library economy and um, the fact that he's a co-founder. He was the co-founder of American Library Association. And the fact that he, he actually not only developed the Dewey Decimal Classification, but for many, many decades, particularly in the United States, file cabinets with others um, folders with a tab on. He is actually, um, <laughs> he actually invented that and made a lot of money in order to support his other interests in libraries. Um, very interesting man and he was, um, he co-organized a um, Winter Olympics as well. So on and so forth. Uh, I would say that whether you like Dewey Decimal Classification or not, um, he's a great man. He's very interesting. Um, why people my own might not like Dewey Decimal Classification. My students never like it because, <laughs> because I force them to create very complicated, complex numbers out of Dewey. And, you know, some of these ins instructions in Dewey Decimal Classification actually are not very, very intuitive. And then they will say, well, add to base number something following dash 74 in, <laughs> in table 2, blah, blah, blah. So uh, quite a few com complicated and complex instructions in Dewey Decimal Classification. However, however, Dewey Decimal Classification could be very simple. So um, I must mention that, well, I think the current Dewey Decimal Classification is the 23rd edition of it. And there's also an abbreviated edition of Dewey Decimal Classification that one might want to use, um, particularly in public and school libraries. We really don't want to get so complicated. and. Um, and I know that some some of the libraries actually have made the rules that, well, although you see Dewey Decimal Classification, we can have a, um, maybe a 15-digit um, class number, we are going to make the rule locally that we just cut off. We don't want anything more than six digits, okay? And this is, this is true in many, many libraries um, for, Many reasons. One is that one when one is constructing Dewey Decimal classification, those numbers could be become very complicated, and and that means that it's going to be very very time consuming. In that case, another thing is that well, if we use DDC um, as part of the call number, when the number gets long, um, it really doesn't go very well on the label um, that you are going to put on the spine of the book. So there are quite some reasons people would prefer one or the other or an abridged version of DDC. So um, how does Dewey Decimal, how is Dewey Decimal classification structured? So instead of a more broad and shallow classification, it is a little bit uh, more in-depth uh, than um, uh, 
Library of Congress classification, and it has these 10 main classes running from 000 to 900. And in, for each of these main classes, it has subclasses and then so-called hundreds and thousands um, division, and then we can move on to into the schedule onto the schedule, and you can see that some some of the classes will go a little bit deeper, and then plus the fact that you have a chance to construct a particular class number for the subject um, according to the instructions. <coughs> So, um, I don't know how many of you um, use the web delay or are you using the physical uh, volumes of the DDC. Um, I still kind of prefer the print DDC much more. Um, I, I'm still having quite a, quite a bit of trouble navigating the um, the web theory in, in many, many ways, but it would always be helpful if you know how the print version of DDC is organized, and then that will really help you with um, navigating the web theory as well. So, um, as I talked as I have mentioned, the notation in DDC, they do not have letters. It's, it's really just a numeral system um, that um, Melville Dewey devised. And, and when Dewey devised the, the numeral system, one of the principles that he has in mind is that because these numbers are going to be understandable, okay? It is assumed that people around the world internationally will understand these numbers because it is a universal language. Um, and also, when, when Dewey devised the DDC, another thing that's very, very different from Library of Congress classification is that he not there was not a um, collection, or at least not explicitly in his mind. Uh, however, we have to say that in, in one way or another, when Dewey devised this particular system, he does have his own well views upon what is called the knowledge universe. So it might not be a, a strong U.S. space, but a lot of critiques will go into the schedule, the 200 schedules, which is on religion, because uh, the religion, under the 200 religion, there will be 10 subclass, or the 100 division. Um, within this, the 10 subclasses, um, nine of them are concerned with Christianity, and one of them is called other religion. So you can see that, well, with, with DDC, um, although Dewey has the mind of this is going to be used internationally, um, it, it, he does impose some of his own well view um, into the system. But um, anyway, so let's go back to the organization of DDC. Now, um, if you have a print version, uh, I mean, I have only touched the 22nd. I have, I don't have a 23rd edition of DDC, but I assume that the um, structure would pretty much the, would be pretty much the same. In volume one of the DDC, um, there's the manual and tables. Okay, and down uh, in volume. Actually, volume one sometimes is uh, what are they used for? They are really for constructing um, DDC number when needed, but a lot of times we will look, first look at the summaries. And then we have schedules in volume three as well, and then in volume four, that is called uh, what we have the, where we have the relative index. If some of you have used um, classification, Web, class web, that tool, um, in many, many ways, the, the correlation provided by that particular site is really supported, you know, I mean, maybe inspired by the idea of relative index in the decimal 
um, do it as more classification. So what is the relative index? Uh, this is actually just like a list of vocabularies, okay? It almost looks like a list of subject headings. Um, the, the usefulness of this is that uh, when you say, well, I want to look up the class number for cataloging. How do I do that? Well, there are two ways to go around it. Very, very traditionally, um, the instructor will tell you to say, well, you first go to the summaries and look up where cataloging might belong, which class cataloging might belong, and then, oops, <laughs> and then, um, and then you find the subclasses and find the right uh, class number for that. When Dewey device Dewey Decimal Classification, he has this in mind that, well, we want to move things on more efficiently and quickly. This is really one of his ethos <laughs> or one of the, the reasons that motivates his invention. So he, he has this relative index that lists some very selective vocabularies. And if you look up cataloging, then it will really actually point out that, well, these are the classes that might fit your need. All right, go to 0 to 5.3, all right? So that's the use of relative index. Um, within these four volumes, unlike the Library of Congress classification, really you are just looking for the box that you want to um, look for. Uh, you really sometimes have to use uh, three volumes at the same time in order to construct a class number. So I have a very um, simple, simple example here. And with uh, WebDuel, it actually is not as uh, crazy now that these numbers are difficult to construct. But for, for some of the, if you're trying to construct some very specific subjects, it could be kind of still very tricky. But anyway, here, um, say, if we want to construct a um, class number for a museum in Pennsylvania, then what do we have to do is uh, first of all first find the class for museums, right? So if if we are going with the way how the summaries will list, what the summaries list is really the main classes and up to the thousand division. So it will run through zero 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 to nine 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 if that number is there. Okay, and it will list all these things, but we find that 708 actually indicates galleries, museums, private collections of fine and decorative arts. All right, then now we have to figure out how do we find the Pennsylvania, and it's just prescribed in the classification system. So if you are looking into Dewey Decimal Classification, you will see that the 708.1 will indicate North America, which means that museums in North America will work, all right? And then you will see actually that there's a number that says 708.13219, um, and then it says, well, if you want to find a place within the United States, then you will have to um, go to table two and within a certain range and find a place. And in this case, in, in table two, 748 indicates Pennsylvania. And the, because the instruction will say that, well, add to the base number 708.1, um, following dash seven, in the table two, which means that we will cut off the number seven and then put a, a connect with 48 there. So it's kind of complicated sometimes or, or whether, but you have to also think about do it as a very, very smart person to devise a system that how does it know there won't be an overlapping like number, you know, that becomes a homonym. So um, this is one way 
to show that, well, there, there are some other cases that you might not go to the tables to create a new class number, but actually you will add um, a subject from another um, class in the schedule to create a brand new class number. In this sense, which means that not all classes are enumerated in that uh, Dewey Decimal Classification System because a lot of times it, with all very many different combinations, you will be able to create much more, many more um, numbers based on this rather slant <laughs> volume of DDC. So, um, Another thing that I, I was thinking about, well, maybe do it as DDC is not that U.S. based, but actually, if you look at the tables, particularly for the geographical um, names, you, you will see that it is a rather um, U.S. based in the sense that the some of the uh, geographical places actually get down to the county level, uh, and that's quite amazing. Um, in that sense, because for some, for other countries, there's no way, there's no way that you will find a number for a certain county or a province or something like that. So, let's take a look at that representation and organization, and there are a lot to talk about here about principles of classification. Well. When we t think about principle, principles of classification, there are really like um, two sides of a coin, right? One is that what are the principles for devising or for developing a classification system? And then on the other side of it, how are we going to choose a class for the resource right in front of us? Okay? so. What do we do um, when we have something right in front of us? So let me try to oops <laughs> draw a book. Um, I often laugh at myself because I don't draw well, but I really like drawing in class because um, it seems like it makes the class a little bit more fun. <laughs> but, for example, very traditionally, okay, we have a book here. So, and then we say we are going to choose a class for it, or class marks to be very, very specific, which means that we are going to choose, well, either a notation from the LCC or the DDC or some other classification system. Well, here we are dealing with the question of what, right? In some ways, what? And when we are choosing these particular things, we are thinking about representation. We are trying to use a class to represent the book in order to organize it. <laughs> All right? So, in this particular case, it is a very tricky thing to do because you are putting the book in one of the categories, one of the boxes, as we can see in classification system, look at the hierarchy and all that. It's just all these different drawers and boxes, and you are going to choose one location for this particular thing. But you want it to be representative, and it represents the book and then it will fall into the right box, and which means that whenever you go back to that particular drawer, or you go back to that particular folder, or you go back to that particular class number, uh, you are going to find the things that you want, all right? Um, it is really just very simple, but at the same time could be very complicated, because, well, a book could have many subjects sometimes, well, what do we do with that? Well, a lot of times when we do subject analysis, we say, well, you know what? Well, these things have multiple subjects, okay? But when you choose a class mark, um, you can only choose one, or at least 
in the meantime, we can only choose one customer because it is still sort of constrained by the physical location that the fact that we do use the class number four for the purpose of shelving. So it typically is where we have been um, taught to think a lot about the bonus, what are the significant characteristics of the book. But I will also suggest that we need to also think about who, all right? Who, who are going to use this particular item and how they might think about it. Now, a lot of times, a lot of people have claimed that, well, you know what, doing subject analysis or selecting subject headings or selecting this class, uh, putting the book into a classification system, this whole process is so subjective because this is going to be based on your own interpretation. Well, I will say that Yes and no, because if when I am doing assigning a class mark to a book or assigning certain subject headings to a book or other types of resources, of course, it, in some ways, this is based on my interpretation, but I don't want it to be my interpretation. And in many ways, I hopefully, this is going to be our interpretation, which means that if I assign a certain class to a certain resource, I would hope that, I would expect that you would agree with me. Or who are you or who are these people? They are the people who are going to use this particular resource and they will have more or less the same interpretation. Well, of course, we, could, uh, we always argue that there, um, in many, many cases, uh, we don't always have the same interpretation and over time even I might change my mind as to what might be the best um, class or what might be the best subject for a particular resource. However, if we have put this particular them in mind, who's going to use that and, and it will be our interpretation, that will at least um, that will at least reduce the biases in this interpretation. Now, another thing, some, some people might say, well, uh, you know what, some, some instructor will, will argue that this particular process, you should be as neutral as possible or as objective as possible. Well, that's another end of it, right? Totally neutral or subjective. but Really, what might be, we might be just end up in the very middle of it, or what do you mean by neutral? Neutral means of not imposing uh, one's own bias in assigning subjects. However, it doesn't mean that it's totally neutral because we all grow up in a different culture, we have maybe different educational background that will inform us to choose um, different things. So one of the examples, uh, I was uh, digging up Hathi Trust Library for some exercises um, for my students in class and um, for some reason I ran into this book titled, entitled Female Homosexuality. Interesting thing, it was published in 1956, as I remember, in the 50s. So um, I asked my students, what do you think might be the class of subjects um, of this particular book? In modern days, in now they would have words to pop up in their mind, homosexuality or um, gender or whatnot. But in the 50s, this particular type of book are is often categorized as mental disorder. So things do change over time, but there are things that we want to include most others um, it, that we, we will agree on the interpretation, uh, but again, we are going to foresee how the future uh, generations might see this. And, first, and after all, this is 
what you are going to tell the public in the sense that if you are going to put a subject or put into a certain put the resource in a certain class in one way or another you are really telling the people what this is all about okay so that's quite a bit of responsibility there now, another thing that sometimes we will need to consider, and last thing here is where. When a book has many subjects, um, or if you go on to um, classification web and you search, and then there's a bunch of class number that's provided for you. Say, for example, it says QA, okay, 025 and then QA028, um, well, really, within this particular range of classification numbers, a lot of times they might or might not um, differ that much, or they pretty much fall into the right range, and then you will say, well, which one should I choose? Now, the way would be very important. In this particular case, I think one thing that's important is that if you do have a shelf, if you do have a shelf and you have all these books here, okay, then one thing to consider is that where do you want to put this onto this shelf? And who are the neighbors of this particular book? When a range of class number might work just as almost the same. And what will be really, really helpful is that this book is going to um, be a neighbor of something that's very, very similar to, to it. And in that particular case, it, it is in some ways a um, a chance to, for you, for the catalogers to actually maintain a certain level of consistency um, in a particular library. Because every institution might have assigned different classes or multiple catalogers might have uh, assigned a slightly different different classes for the same subject even sometimes. So one of the things that one could maintain is actually go to the where and look at, well, where do I actually want to put it while the subjects are actually close enough um, in terms of what it means or what it represents. So I think I'll stop here and if you have questions, please um, feel free to ask or else just send me an email and I will be happy to um, show you some other things. And uh, here, this is just a selected bibliography. Um, if you're interested in some of the, uh, some of those are a little bit more practical, and some of them are a little bit more of a theoretical and interesting um, articles to read. I think a lot of you might be also interested in digging into Sandy um, Brown's book, but <laughs> that was a while ago. So. Okay, thank you, Lai. Uh, I don't see any questions uh, typed in the box. Oh, uh, somebody saying thank you. This was very interesting. Thank you very much. So uh, I do have to see that in the question box. If, if you do have some questions, we are almost out of time, but um, go ahead and, and type your uh, questions in if you want, and we'll try and answer what we can. Uh, I got another thanks for the program. I see that. So, uh, and, and please know this is being recorded, so you can always access it again, and you'll be sent that recording along with the slides. And, and as Lai said, you can send her any questions you have uh, after the program's over, and she can answer them then. So, um, okay, I don't see any more. Do you have anything else you need to add, Lai? Um, well, um, this is more like really an overview of the two main classifications and, and other things. So 
if you have specific questions as to like how to use web DOA and all that, you're welcome to ask as well. But, but I, I didn't try to show all those tools here. <laughs> Okay, well thank you very much. Um, uh, we want to thank you live for that insightful program that has provided us with some helpful information on uh, the principles of classification. We hope you found today's webinar useful and let me show my screen here. Uh, we hope you found today's webinar useful. You will soon be receiving a uh, you soon will receive a short online evaluation, evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. The comments that are received are reviewed by the ELECTS committee and are used to plan additional continuing education offerings. And just a reminder, once again, this webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email shortly after its conclusion with a link to the recording and you will receive a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Now, for your convenience, I've noted on this slide that you're viewing the up upcoming webinars. On November 28th, there will be holding uh, a webinar on holding comparisons. Why are they so complicated? And on December 5th and December 12th, there are two webinars that are being presented by uh, Library of Congress Anna Christensen. And those webinars are in, the, are in Spanish and they're the version of her September presentation, Recording RDA Elements in Mark 21 Fields in Name Authority Records. Information about Information about all Alex webinars are featured on the Alex homepage and web address is as given here on this slide. Uh, new webinars and CE events are continuously being developed, so check the Alex homepage frequently for new information. We welcome suggestions for webinars and other continuing educational opportunities. You may submit a proposal online using the Alex webinar proposal form found at the Alex Continuing Education homepage. In closing, I would like to thank Wade Weidkopf for providing technical support for today's webinar. Wade and his colleagues on the CE Committee's Technical Support Subcommittee make it possible to present these webinars smoothly. Again, we appreciate you uh, attendance today and we hope you will join us again for other presentations uh, as Alex has planned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>